Okay, so we can begin. We'll start with three bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. And then we'll do the salutation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Okay, so good morning, everybody. And today is May 7th, 2022. Okay, and so today we're, con we're continuing with our reading of the Anguttara the Nikaya Book of Fours. And now we come to Sutta number 200, which is about the theme of basically of affection and hatred. How does affection arise? How does hatred arise? And this sutta sort of sets out a template or a kind of outline involving four possible relations between these two emotions. So actually these are two dominant emotions in human affairs, affection and well, hatred will be the extreme form, but it can be irritation, annoyance, dislike, resentment. Maybe let's say if we could come up with a number of um, common terms for these two basic poles of, of human relationships. So here we have one is affection. What would be some synonyms or near synonyms for this? Yeah, the Pali word that's used is pema. You can help me out. Say again. Infatuation. Okay, that would be a rather strong, rather strong. Liking. Yeah. Liking. I think liking. Like, yeah. Like. <laughs> okay. Joy, enjoyment. Enjoy. Enjoyment is more in relation to things. Of course, you enjoy somebody's company. Understood. Yeah. Loving like, kindness. Would that be part of? I think of this is more a feeling with attachment underlying it. Mm. But loving kindness, at least in the sense of metta, is more an impersonal and impartial, mm. ideally an impersonal and partial quality. Devotion. Mm. I Good think devotion. devotion, actually devotion would work for the word pema under certain, in certain usages. Like the Buddha speaks about pema in relation to the Tathagata, that is to himself, to the Buddha. Then it comes to mean devotion. But there's a common English word. That sometimes it's said that the, the world revolves around that particular word. He liked. Say again. Delight. Again, delight is a bit like enjoyment. Goodwill. Fondness. Goodwill is like loving kindness. Love. Love, exactly. Yeah, no. mm -hmm. Love. Okay, liking, love. Someone said fondness. Fondness, yeah. Preference. Preference? Yeah. 
in a sense, but in preference could have such a very broad sense, like Closeness. I have preference for a particular kind of food. I prefer maybe Italian food over what, Hungarian food. Endearment. Okay, I think that's good. Endearment. Connection. Yeah, okay. Connection, again, is very broad, but I think we have a basic idea here. And then the opposite of this would be the opposite. Let's see what the poly has. I think it's dosa. Yeah, the poly uses the word dosa, which is what usually represents as hatred. But maybe hatred is the strong, suggests has a strong nuance to it. What would be some other resentment? word? Resentment. Okay, resentment. Dislike. Yeah, dislike. Hostility. Again? Hostility. Oh, hostility, yeah. Antipathy. Antipathy, yeah. Irritation. Antagonism. Indifference. Ir ir irritation is a bit broad because you could be irritated by the mosquito constantly landing <laughs> on my skin. This is something that applies to relationships between people. Disdain. Actually, that's a good one, disdain. Wow, there's so many more words, it seems, for... <laughs> and then another kind of strong, persistent manifestation of hatred, particularly what leads maybe countries to go to a country to go to war against another country. Animosity. Yeah, I, that's what, isn't the word that I was thinking about, but that is also another useful word. It starts with an E. Enmity. Enmity. Whoops. Okay, I think we have enough. Yeah, and it's interesting the way the early Abhidhamma is constructed. It's constructed around chains of synonyms. So let me see if I could find an Abhidharma text to illustrate this. Okay, so, well, actually the Abhidhamma would fo focus on loba, which is greed, and then it would have the chain of synonyms for greed rather than affection. But um, it's easier for hatred, the equivalence of hatred, so it has a chain of words. Ah, okay, here. Ah, there's another word, another term that's commonly used. It's actually a compound, but very common in Buddhist usage, ill will. And then that can be expressed using the Latin equivalent, malevolence. So we have here 
in the definition of ill will. So what is ill will? Hatred, hating, um, opposition, resentment, displeasure, anger, antagonism, and so forth. Okay, so anyway, from these chain of synonyms, we get some, yeah, maybe under affection, we could also put attachment, even though that's quite general, attachment, um, okay, liking, love, fondness, endearment, attachment, infatuation. Craving? Yeah, though craving is kind of very broad and general. So the strong desire for anything is craving. Clinging. Attraction. Attraction. Again, that's general, but um, we might put it there. With the Desirable. Well, desirable is a trait that inheres in the object of the liking or fondness. Lust. Yeah, lust tends to shade off, maybe in a somewhat different direction from affection itself, where especially lust, at least in English, suggests like a sexual sexual desire. But desire itself, we might use. No, I, I'll leave desire out of the picture. Okay, Papa, tenderness. Okay, maybe that could work also. Okay, so we have some idea. I think this is sufficient. So let us now look at the sutta explanation of how these four things arise. So the first is we have affection being born from affection. So how is this the case? Okay, so here we have one person is, is let's say desirable, lovable and agreeable to another. So let's say I have a affection. Well, let me put myself out of a picture. A likes B, likes or loves B. Okay, now others, we'll call you C, B and E, Treat B nicely. So others treat B in a way that's desirable, lovable, and agreeable. Okay, so now it occurs to A that Others that C, D, and E are treating B nicely in a way that's lovable and agreeable. And so what happens in my feelings or the way A feels about C, D, and E? So the sutta says that A will feel affection for C, D, and E. Okay, so just maybe to illustrate. So I have, maybe there's a younger monk that I have friendly feelings towards. And then I bring him I, he, to accompany me. We go to visit another monastery.
And then the monks there treat this younger monk in a friendly way, a nice way, cordial way. And so because they're treating him nicely, then for me, affection will arise towards the monks in the monastery that we're visiting. And you can apply this in your own life. Maybe you have a friend and then you bring your friend into a circle of other friends and you introduce your friend to those other friends and they all are very cordial towards your friend. So they'll offer him a seat, maybe some refreshments and they sort of get along well together. And so this will, even though you initially started with affection for the people that you're visiting, but you feel even more a stronger affection for them because they're treating your own friend who you're introducing your friend to them for the first time. And they're treating this new friend very agreeable ways. And so this will strengthen your affection for your old friends. Okay, so that makes good sense. Okay, now we come to the second possibility. So in this case, we have hatred born from affection. Okay, so we have, so here I have affection for a particular person, or more generally A likes or loves B, and then others treat that person, others treat B in a way that's, here the text uses the word undesirable, unlovable, disagreeable. So others treat B in rudely, let's say, rudely or disagreeably. What are some other ways, uh, terms we could use? Rudely, disagreeably, roughly? Disrespectfully. Okay. Disrespectfully. Brusquely, curtly, crudely. Okay, we just use one more. Unkindly. Unkindly. Okay. Okay, so then what happens is A feels ill will, or even if the feeling is really strong, it can turn into hatred towards C, D, and E. Okay, so you have maybe a group of relatives, and then you have a friend towards whom you have strong affection, and you bring this friend of yours, you're going to introduce him or her to your relatives. You bring them there to a gathering, and your relatives treat your friend rudely, roughly, disrespectfully, and so on. So what happens in your feelings towards your relatives? towards the other people. Maybe it doesn't quite turn, if they're relatives, maybe it won't turn to ill will or hatred, but some kind of disagreeable feeling will arise towards them. Isn't that the case? Like resentment? Yeah, I would say resentment is probably the best. Say again? Disappointment. Or even just, yeah. 
Let's say disappointment is weaker, resentment is stronger. Racist. I didn't quite catch that. Racist. 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 Yeah. I'm not thinking in re in terms of racial relationships. Okay. Um, okay, so there'll be some disappointment. <laughs> But disappointment applies mainly towards not so much your attitude towards the people themselves, but disappointment applies to the way your relatives treat your friend. How about but, discrimination? No, I think we have enough with resentment. Okay, but there will arise resentment towards your relatives. It's actually your relatives who are showing discrimination towards your friend, but the feeling that arises in you towards the relatives will be some disappointment in them, resentment towards them. And if it gets really strong, it will turn into ill will, even could be animosity. So sometimes, yeah, this could even lead to, I mean, if this happens repeatedly, it could lead to like a split in the family. So this I think is quite a common event within families that when one sector of the family becomes friends with some outside party and other members of the family don't like that outside acquaintance of the other people and continually criticize and harass the first group for befriending the other party, then it can lead to a split in the family. So we have two groups, those who are friendly towards the outside person and those who are hostile towards the outside person. And because of that difference in their attitude towards the outside person, the family becomes polarized, split. Okay, so this is case two. The other, so here we have case one. Could angry or mad play into this situation? Of course there'll be, yeah, could be some anger also. Okay, but then, so sort of like anger will arise or disappointment. Um, yeah, please, I have to ask everybody to mute, the, mute themselves. Okay. Okay, so, so this is possibility number two. Yeah, I think I was saying that if this happens like on just on, an, on one particular occasion, then some disappointment or anger could arise in A towards C, D, and E. But if it happens repeatedly, if C, D, and E consistently treat B in ways that are rude and disagreeable, then that anger and disappointment can turn into ill will and animosity of A towards C, D, and E. Okay, let us turn now to case number C. So this is how affection is born from hatred. Okay, so how, now we have a person, a, a case where a person A dislikes person B.
And then others, again, we have C, D, and E. Others, C, D, and E, treat B Again, rudely, disagreeably, or disagreeably, roughly, and so on. Okay, so because A dislikes B, and C, D, and E treat B in this rough and disagreeable way, then in a person with an untrained mind, he will get the sense C, D, and E are my allies, my benefactors. And so then the consequence is that A will feel affection and friendliness, we could say. That's another synonym you should have put. So A will in this case feel affection or friendliness. Toward C, D, and E. Have any of you ever been school children in the past? Yes, Bante. What happens in the schoolyard? You see, if you ever don't remember your days out in the schoolyard, the way students, even students in the same class will form cliques. Something draws certain groups of students together and something else will draw another group of students together. And then it might happen that here we have not individuals, but groups, group A and group B. And then some other group of students, some other students will treat the students in group B rudely and roughly. So then the students in group A will start to feel affection and friendliness towards students C, D, and E. And lo and behold, what happens but students C, D, and E then get drawn into group A. So group A starts to expand and becomes more powerful and more prominent on, in the schoolyard. And it, it, its number increases because of the common dislike of the students in group B. We can see this also playing out even in broader circles if you look at the way political alliances form, okay, so there's like a host of issues around which, say, political alliances form, and the issues might seem to be disconnected, but sort of what unites them together, draws them together, is that these are the issues that sort of center around opposition to another political group. Actually, I don't want to go into the details there because it gets rather messy. Okay, now we'll go into the fourth possibility. And this is, how hatred is born from hatred.
Okay, so in this case, first, what the text says, one person is undesirable, disagreeable to another. Others treat that person, that is the undesirable person, in a way that is desirable, lovable, and agreeable. And then it occurs to the latter, others treat this person who is undesirable or disagreeable to me in a way that is desirable, lovable, and agreeable. So then he feels hatred for them. So that's how hatred is born from hatred. Okay, so let us see how this works. Okay, so here we have A dislikes B and others treat B kindly, etc. Okay, so A dislikes B, and then others treat B with kindness and affection. And so because I dislike B, then, or because A dislikes B, so then A will feel resentment, hatred, ill will towards C, D, and E. And so this is how hatred is born from hatred. Because I have hatred for B, others treat B nicely. So I feel hatred towards C, D, and E. Okay, these are four, in the sutta it's called four things that are born. But I was pondering a little bit about these possibilities and it occurred to me that they could also be min minimally a case of hatred born from love towards the same person, not towards some other person. And I think this is a common development in human relations. So we have A, Love. In fact, this will explain, it's rather sad to say this, but so many of the senseless murders that we read about or hear about from the news. Okay, A loves B. And at some point, the, the feeling is reciprocal. So B reciprocates the feeling of love. So A and B have a strong loving relationship. <laughs> but then B wanders off, maybe forming a relationship with another person. But A still loves B. Now, if A turned indifferent towards B, then even though they might be locked in the same formal relationship, like say they're married, husband and wife, but the husband loses his affection, his attachment to his wife. The wife is just there to cook meals for him, to clean the house, to bring in some additional income, but the husband doesn't care that much for the wife. So if the wife turns cool towards the husband or the wife even develops love towards another man, then A still remains indifferent was this, but 
the husband still loves the wife, but doesn't manifest the affection very strongly. So B, the wife develops an affection for another man, forms a relationship with that other man, but the husband still loves the wife. And because he still loves his wife, then he develops at the same time, hatred towards the wife and towards the other man. And so the common scenario is the husband, again, this is rather shocking and sad. And in this country, it's relatively common because the country is just awash with guns. The husband will go to the shop, buy a gun, or he'll already have a gun. He suspects that the wife is at the other man's apartment, goes there, rings the bell, breaks into the apartment, and shoots his beloved wife, as well as the man who's stolen his wife. Isn't that a common, common occurrence? So here we have hatred born from love and coexisting with love. We could... And this goes on not only in personal relationships, but we could see it also happening in international relations. And I think, in my understanding, what is going on in Ukraine right now is a sterling example of this. Okay, here we have Putin loves Ukraine. You know, it might seem from his action launching the war against Ukraine that he doesn't love it, but actually before he launched his attack on Ukraine back going back, what, 10 years or so. He loved Ukraine in the sense that he thought the Ukrainian people are not a separate nationality, but they are really also part of Russia, traditionally part of Russia, that there's no separate Ukrainian nation. Ukraine is traditionally part of the larger Russian sphere of influence. and we want to incorporate Ukraine into Russia, or at least make Ukraine a kind of subordinate and dependency, a dependent state dependent on Russia. So Putin loves Ukraine, but Ukraine, at least the majority, including the leadership, Oops. Doesn't exactly love Putin. And in fact, they start sort of drifting off towards Europe, towards the European Union. And so Putin still, in a sense, loves Ukraine because he wants to um, vanquish Ukraine and absorb Ukraine into Russia or set up a puppet government to administer Ukraine. But Ukraine has been a little bit like the wife who's straying from the marital relationship. Ukraine is drifting off and sort of getting friendly with Europe signing some trade agreements with Europe, talking about joining the European Union, even possibility of joining NATO. And so Putin's love for Ukraine turns to hatred at the same time that he wants to possess Ukraine. And so then the consequence is love turns to hatred, and from hatred, we get an invasion.
Okay, there are probably many other complications in human relationships possible with, because love and hatred are not, let's say they're not mute, in my understanding, not mutually exclusive feelings, but there can be sort of a love if it has the form of attachment, has the potential for developing into hatred as we saw in the case of the tense marital relationship and in the case even of international affairs. So love, if it's love in the form of attachment, not love in the form of goodwill, wishing for the well-being and happiness of the others, but if it's a desire to possess and dominate the beloved person, then it has the seed or potential of turning into hatred. Is there a way in which hatred can turn into love? Does hatred have the potential of turning into love? What do you think? Uh, yes, Bante. Can you elaborate? Um, say sworn enemies. Uh, then an incident happened where one of the enemy almost got drowned and the other enemy saved him. So because of that, he became good friends. Oh, that's a good case. The, you said the swan and the mice? Is that what you said? No, uh, the, the, the swan enemies, you know, uh, they've been fighting for each other for many years. Then, uh, well, sort of uh, say family feud or something like that. So well, what, is, what is swan and mice? Of oh, swan, S-W-O-R-N, swan enemies. Oh, sworn enemies, I see. Yeah, yeah. I see, yes. I, I thought you were trying to yeah. say swan and mice. <laughs> <laughs> sworn Sorry. enemies. Yeah, okay, yes. okay. Yeah, actually that reminds me of an incident that took place maybe when I was in the second or third grade elementary school. Um, there was another boy in the class who used to be very nasty towards me. I don't know why, but for some reason, he was a bit of a bully and he used to pick on me and I was small for my age. <clears throat> like when the teacher wasn't looking, he would smack me or punch me. Um, make spitballs and throw the spitballs at me. Please people mute your microphone. <laughs> okay. You know, so he used to smack me sitting behind me. He would, when the teacher wasn't looking, he would smack me, throw spitballs at me, squeeze my hand, uh, trip me up, try to trip me up. And then I think I complained about this to the teacher. And then the teacher brought us together. And I mean, it's very vague in my memory, but we had some little talk with each other in the presence of the teacher. And then we became friends. We became very good friends so that I would go to his house and visit him. He would come to my house and visit me. And after school, we would play ball together. So we became friends. Okay, so this seems to be the end of this part of the sutta. Now the sutta is going to continue in another direction, but let's see if we have any questions or comments at this point and please use the hand symbol because um, I don't, it's difficult for me to go looking at the comments box while I'm teaching the, the class. 
And okay, Wiley, lower the hand. Okay. Yeah, your mic is open. Yeah, you could. Oh, talk. okay. Um, have you ever heard the? You see it on the internet sometimes. The term frenemy. I don't think I've heard it, but I could understand what it means. Yeah, you know, if you watch a group of people that or a pair of people Friend. that are committed long-term enemies with a feud, a lot of times over the course of their life, if you look at it, the way they interact, yeah, that's not, they're not enemies. That's a romance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are so devoted to each other. They yeah. really care what happens to each other. But mm. if you ever talk to them about it, they're enemies. Yeah, I could understand that. That's part of the complexity of the human relationship. Yeah, that just seemed to yeah. connect yeah. with that last example you gave. That yeah. Last. yeah. Well, in that last example with the person in my class, the other boy in the class, our mm -hmm. feeling changed from, or at least his feeling towards me changed from enmity towards friendliness. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that we had that the Right. hostile relationship continued after that we just became like ordinary friends hmm. but i understand that they're kind of i think this occurs even within marital relationships um the husband and wife they can be bitter in their day-to-day -day interactions aggressive towards each other mean and cruel towards each other. But if you suggest that they divorce or separate, oh no, they're so deeply attached to each other that they can't even conceive of living apart. Okay, let's move on. Next we have Sut. You have to unmute. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mark. So what's the, uh, what's the overall like take home message with this. I mean, I guess all of these are unwholesome. Is that what the uh, take home message would be? Because even if you uh, have an affection, you know, that's not going to last forever. I mean, is this. Yeah. But actually, well, the sutta, as it develops, it's going to go on to explain how a monk overcomes both the, the affection and the hatred and then becomes fully and then finally abandons them with the attainment of our hardship. But this actually brings up an interesting point that I meant to um, that I meant to discuss. And this is from this passage, the way this sutta develops, you might get the impression that for early Buddhism, affection is something always to be eliminated and overcome. But I think what the Buddha is speaking about here is the kind of affection that's rooted in attachment, maybe dependency, greed, or selfishness. But there are wholesome types of affection that where people come together out of some wholesome commitment, some shared commitment to the good. And we can see this in the idea that's very prominent in Buddhism of Kalyana Mitras, good friends or spiritual friends. And then there was a sutta I was going to bring up. Yeah, this is a section in the Sangyutta Nikaya. It's called the Datu Sangyutta. It's a, a, a section in the Datu Sangyutta which is chapter 14 in the Sangyutta Nikaya, where the Buddha is explaining how beings, or we could say people, come together and unite. And he says, <clears throat> it's by way of elements. And the word that's used here is datu, which here would have the meaning of like some kind of character trait or the other word used is disposition. That brings people together. And then he says that those of an inferior 
this position. And the word there is hina. A low or an inferior disposition come together and unite with those of an inferior disposition and those of a good disposition. I think it's Panita. come together and unite with those of a good disposition. Or it might be Kalyana, no, it's Panita, I think. I could say a superior disposition. Okay, and then he illustrates this. Yeah. Okay, one way in which he illustrates this is on an occasion, the Buddha is living at Rajagaha, and then he sees a group of monks walking back and forth, not far from him, various groups of monks. And then he points out, he says, do you see Sariputta walking back and forth with a number of monks? And then they say, yes. And then the Buddha says, all those monks are of great wisdom. And so in this case, that element that unites these monks, why they come together and sort of flock to Sariputta is because those monks are inclined towards wisdom. Sort of that is their dominant datu, their disposition, their, their inclination of mind. Then a number of monks gather around Mogalana. Those are monks who either they have great idi, psychic power, or maybe they're interested in developing the psychic powers. Okay, then there's Maha Kasapa, who is at the head of a group of monks. And then the Buddha says that all of those monks sort of are inclined towards the ascetic practices, the austere practices, because Maha Kasapa was the foremost in the practice of the austerities. And then there's Anuruddha, who's the head of monks who developed the divine eye and so on and so on. But then when you come to the end, okay, near the end, you see Ananda walking back and forth. And so the group of monks that gather around Ananda are monks who are interested in learning the Dhamma. So those are the ones with good memories who want to preserve the Dhamma. And then the Buddha points out Devadatta, that was the Buddha's evil cousin. So there's a group of monks that gather around Devadatta, and the Buddha says that those are monks with evil wishes. Those are the ambitious monks who want to become powerful and to get name and fame. Okay, then another sutta points out the kinds of factors that bring people together. So it starts off in the same way. And then first, those of an inferior disposition. So those who lack faith, these skeptics come together with the skeptics, those without a sense of shame, without a sense of moral dread, without learning, those who are lazy, those without mindfulness, those without wisdom, they come together and unite. And then on the other hand, those who have faith, a sense of shame, sense of wrongdoing, who are learned, energetic, and mindful, those with wisdom, they come together and unite. Oh, I just noticed the typographical error here. I seem to have omitted the, oh, no, here it is, the lazy with the lazy and the energetic with the energetic. And then we have various permutations of these from one sutta to another. But the basic point that I want to make is that when the text is speaking here about overcoming affection, it doesn't mean that 
we have to become like stones or blocks of wood without any affection at all. But the kind of affection that's to be overcome is the affection rooted in attachment or the urge to control, to dominate, or dependency, the feeling that one can't do anything without the support of somebody else. But in other places, the Buddha encourages the development of good friendship or noble friendship. And naturally within those friendships, affection will arise, affection which is rooted in good qualities. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions or comments. So Sue, do you ask your question? So you could lower the hand unless you have another one. Okay, and then Brenda, Brenda Walsh. Yes, Bante, thank you. Um, in, in my practice over the years, one thing I've noticed is when um, people get together, the danger of airing grievances against someone else. Um, yes. I, fi I find it very common and there's sort of a, an underlying expectation of a, sim a, 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 a negative reaction against yeah. the person against whom the grievance is being aired. Yeah. And then I've noticed that if, if I myself allow myself to take up some of that negativity, yeah. and then over time, the original person's grievance goes away. And, and I've noticed that you're left with this little feeling of antipathy that wasn't even yours to start with, you know, mm -hmm. and the, the real danger of that. The other thing is, um, this is a little embarrassing, but if you've ever watched a revenge movie, the way it's structured is to manipulate your emotions. So you take on this, mm -hmm. this, this, you know, once removed anger. <laughs> it's, mm. it's um, anyway, yes. those are my comments. That's a series of movies. I don't know what it is. This or is a television a, program. This is a sort of a, a subset where, where someone has something happen, like in the family, someone is murdered in the Father yeah. goes off seeking yeah. revenge, and yeah. um, and it, it it if you're not careful and mindful, first of all, you shouldn't be watching them anyway. Yeah. Um, but secondly, you, it it's designed to manipulate your emotions to kind of yeah. cheer on the revengeful person. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, with regard to the first point that you brought up, I noticed like many years ago when I was living in Sri Lanka at a particular monastery, there was another monk who was staying with us for some time. And he would often be making like negative comments about, especially about other monks. He doesn't like this monk because he doesn't shave often enough. And so his whiskers are too long. But another monk who shaves every day, he complains, why does that monk shave every day? <laughs> every day? Why doesn't he grow his whiskers a little bit longer and shave every three or four days? Um, he does, he's complaining about the way this monk walks, what this monk behaves. And what I noticed was when I would associate with that monk, initially I would start joining in the criticism of the other monks and sort of sort of laugh along with him and you know, just dwell on the criticisms and add my own criticisms. And then I realized that this is sort of infecting my own mind. And so I made a determination. I, I had to associate with that monk because he was living at our monastery. So, you know, there would be times when we like get together for tea in the evening, but I would made the determination, a sort of resolution, don't speak anything critical about others. And I found that to be a very, very helpful practice because when the other monk is speaking critically and ridiculing or condemning or blaming others, sort of my own natural inclination is to join in the criticism. It's coming from a sort of deep underlying root. But then when I made the determination not to speak criticism, then the tendency is still coming up in the mind, but because I'm resisting it, gradually it gets weaker and weaker until it sort of fades away. And then I just sort of 
remain patiently listening to the other monk and then as quickly as possible, I would change the topic of discussion to something, to something else. I know it, it's interesting because it's like the original motive might be to feel supportive of the person who's speaking, yeah. or if you're the speaker seeking support, yeah. but it really changes yeah. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Bente. Okay, Sumana. You have to unmute. Thank you, Bante. Bante, is, um, is it possible that people come together by random and not just by karma? Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Of course, people come together randomly, um, but it's an interesting question why certain people naturally feel an aff why, let's say, why you would naturally feel an affection towards some people and spontaneously feel some kind of maybe a distance towards others or even some kind of dislike for other people. Like, let us say you come into a room and there's a whole group of people that you've never met before, you don't know any of them, and you just look around the room. And when you look at some people, you feel a liking towards them. And you look at other people, you feel you know, a bit put off by them, but you don't know anything about them. Why does that happen? Am I alone in having that experience? Past life? It could be some relation connection from a previous life. Maybe the other say, others are your disposition. It, like could be, uh, it could be that even though you don't know the other people at, at all, but there's just some kind of, maybe call it a psychological resonance with some and the psychological dissonance or discord with the others. And even though the, not a word has been spoken, exchanged with them, but just, I know there's a kind of psychological, I think that this is very true, though it sounds a little bit new agey, that there are psychic fields around people. And so certain people's psychic fields will blend and harmonize with each other and other people's psychic fields will clash with each other and create some kind of dissonance. Okay, that's my conjecture. Okay, let's go on. Young, you have to unmute. Bante, yeah. I have a comment. Go ahead. Um, this star, um, I read this star to my bone. It's really, um, I, I felt it. And not just in my personal level, but some politicians promote hatred intentionally. Yeah. And that's my current experience. And I'm, I'm wondering how I, I can uh, overcome this hatred and contribute to a little bit better in harmonizing people. That's, yeah. uh, I'm hoping you can uh, continue this sutta next week. That's my uh, comment. Okay, but um, the question that you bring up is, uh, maybe it requires a more detailed answer and my time is running low. So I just saw one, I'll have to just postpone that. and see if there was one other question that could be answered very simply and easily. Okay, I don't see another question. Okay, Mar Mariam. Yes, Bonte. It's also when people come attracted to each other, I feel like the examples is similarity that they have here, but I've noticed the opposite also attracts each other. Oh, that is, yeah, that is actually true. Yeah, that is very true. It's not only that people have similar characters, but people with very different characters will be attracted to each other, probably because they complement each other. So the person who is, you know, very extroverted, outgoing, sociable, talkative, 
So the person who is quiet, introverted, subdued, a bit shy, might be attracted to the extroverted person, the extroverted person to the introverted person, whereas two extroverted people or two introverted people will keep a distance from each other. Yeah, no so competition often, between them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we're going to have to end here and we'll, we'll continue the sutta next time. And it seems to go off into another direction, almost as if two suttas had been combined to form this longer sutta. Okay, so let us end for the day with the sharing of the merits. And if you know of particular people, either relatives, friends, others that you know who are going through any kind of difficulty, hardship, personal ordeal, then you can share the merits with them. And also we'll share the merits with the people of Ukraine and also with the people of Russia, hoping that some kind of peace can be established between those two countries and so that they could live together in mutual harmony. Ah, kasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang ra kantu sasanang. Ah, kasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang ra kantu deisanang. Ah, kasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika Punyantung anumodipa, chirang ra kantu mang parang, duka pata chani duka, paya pata chani paya, soka pata chani soka, hantu sabepi pani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. And before, wait, before we end for the day, I just remembered something that I sh should have announced. When you got the announcement about today's class, ben beneath the Zoom link, there was an another announcement that tomorrow I'm supposed to give a talk sort of hosted by the Dharma Realm Buddhist University, which is in California in which I'm supposed to propose solutions to all of the problems facing a world in crisis. I think the title of the talk is A Buddhist Response to a World in Crisis. So if you want, if you're free tomorrow afternoon, it will be at three o'clock or is it 3.30 uh, Eastern time, please, you're welcome to join that talk, but you have to register for it. And so the, the link for registering should be available through the announcement. Let me do a check on that. It is Bhante. It is. It is Bhante. Uh, okay, it's there? Okay. Yes. Okay, so please, uh, again, you're invited to join tomorrow. Okay, so let us end with three bows to the Buddha. One. Two, three, and again, and thank you all for joining. Thank you, Bante. 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 Thank you, Bante.